like a gentle dove, settle us with your grace and peace. We welcome your spirit's presence to calm us. Come like a mighty wind, roaring with power from on high. We welcome your spirit's freedom to move deeply in us. Come like an untamed fire, raging with holiness. We welcome your spirit's beauty to burn brightly through us. Come living Lord, come this day, this hour, this moment, for you are welcome here. Nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living Lord. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free. My shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcomed here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what I Six. 
in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to come together. And we do invite your presence, your precious Holy Spirit as we worship, as we share together. May you be glorified in all that we do, O oh God. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. for helping me this way, my ten-page report will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, board members, church members, and friends, thank you for continued trust and support. As we come to the end of the church year, your faithfulness, trust in God's promise, and obedience, I'm pleased to report that all our budgets and bills have been paid. Tithing $173,400, it decreased 10% in relation to last year. And faith promise, 12675 increased 14%. Amen? Yeah. Yes. So total income is 225741 and expense, 235449 and you say, this doesn't make sense. Yep. And the reason for that is that we had the AC system installed. So that makes our, uh, this expense more than income. But you gave $19,000 for that. So we only had to balance the, the numbers. Many thanks to those who count the money each week. Thank you very much. You made my job so much easier, and I appreciate each one of you. We were able to raise 1,054 for Cape Verde Seminar Seminary, a Reverend Silver Scholarship. It's, it's in June, it's coming. For Easter, we had 2,516. And th East, uh, Thanksgiving, 1,579. Alabaster, 900. 
Last year we had Faith Promise Weekend. Uh, I, I think most of you remember if you were here. And uh, they challenged us to help the education um, in Africa, and you gave $200. And they only asked for 100 so we covered two churches. Christmas offering for the ramp, to cover the ramp, ramp $1,926. But we have a total of $10,000. $763 for it. I don't know, but probably half the price. So we still have some to catch up. For generation, Nazarenes have supported the World Evangelism Fund and mission projects. And if you're not part of it, you can become part of this mission to make Christ like disciples in the nations in our, in our community. As we enter a new church year, I look forward to continued growth, both spiritually and financially, as we serve the Lord here at Bethany community and around the world. This is your report. Thank you, and God bless you. I just want to go quick. I hope you can see that. Yeah, all right. So we paid world Evangelism Fund, 9,783. Missions, specials, 8,660. And pension and benefits, 4,023. That's our budget for the year. Edu edu district budget, 9,836. Education budget, 4,500. So that will give us total uh, expense for two 201, 927, and 75. And uh, because the total in and out, that includes the AC, 33,000, our total expenses, 235. The income, we have total income for 212 and 199, in and out 13,542, for a total income of 225 and 741. And uh, on the side, we have the, a breakdown of the, uh, the World Evangelism Fund we they gave for Africa trafficking, global relief, clean water, Jesus film, missionary health care, world evangelism, and compassion ministry. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it, your help. If you have any questions, No, nope. thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Fernando. That's a lot of numbers to keep track of and to keep things going. And uh, when we send out monies to the different things like the missions and, and uh, ENC, the education, they go in different directions. So. Fernando keeps track of all that, so thank you for that. Well, how do you, uh, what do you do after a treasurer's report? You take an offering. <laughs> so we'll ask our ushers to come forward. Let's receive our morning offering, and thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving uh, and uh, worshiping the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to give this morning. It is our joy and our privilege. Thank you, O oh God that we took care of all of uh, our obligations this past year. God, you are gracious and so good. Would you bless those who give this morning and encourage and minister each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
us again. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, oh, comforter and friend, I'll be each and touch again, Holy Spirit, rain Children are dismissed for their service downstairs at this time. Greetings. Uh, this is my first annual church report, so bear with me, please. <laughs> I know it's the responsibility of the trustees to oversee the repair and the maintenance of the properties. And this being an older and much used properties, they always tend to need some kind of care. Uh, I'd like to thank all your, your support in this, and I thank the, uh, the support of my co-trustees, uh, Jeannie and Marty. Um, I've found myself falling on their expertise at times and their, their connections. Uh, earlier this year, we had a problem with the heat down. It was getting rather cold down there, and with Jeannie's help, we did get someone in here to fix that. And just on the opposite side, 
we had a problem in the chapel for a while with the heat staying on, so much so that it was getting very hot. Uh, I thought we might have a pastor roast, <laughs> which would not have been a good thing. <laughs> but it turned out to be a problem with the thermostats. Those rise thermostats are not very dependable, so we put in new thermostats on that, and they're hoping to get programmable balls so we don't have to worry about doing manually, but at least now it's more consistent and more comfortable. Uh, and we also discovered a problem with the heater and the baptismal font. <laughs> And try as I may, I could not get that water quite warm enough. Uh, we almost ended up with a Dave sickle instead. But uh, <laughs> we are putting that off for now. But it is something we have to uh, to address at some point to get to be able to maintain the the proper water. So when we do have baptisms, we don't chill everybody out. <laughs> now, uh, Pastor had noticed there was a piece of flashing that was missing in the front on the top of the. Uh, the chapel. And I want to thank Jim Carrenti for braving the heights of climbing up the ladder without a parachute, mind you. <laughs> and we did get that replaced, and it's uh, much more presentable now. And uh, we are, of course, still looking into getting new entry doors. Uh, Lottie did contact us, uh, connect us with someone in Somerset, we just have to make a specific date to get out there to choose a door and find a, a proper replacement for that. But meanwhile, we did have the locksmith come in, and at least we did get the locks somewhat better repaired, so now it's more accessible and it's easier to use. Um, from there, oh, we did have a problem downstairs with, the, of course, the kitchen faucet. That's been an ongoing thing leaking all over the place. So we did finally get around to replacing that with a new one. So that would de elim eliminate that problem. Now over on the parsonage, we discovered uh, firstly a leak in the, the roof of the shed. Everything was getting wet in there from the heavy rains. Uh, we did notice that, that yes, that, that roof does have to be uh, replaced. That's one of the projects we have and plan to get in there and just put a whole new roof on it. But meanwhile, we did put at least a heavy duty tarp on it, so at least keeping everything everything dry and keeping the equipment in there dry as well. Then after that, well, we'll pass the discovery. We had a, a leak of a, a water marks in their ceiling in the living room. Uh, we tried to investigate what the problem was with that. Climbed up there, checked out the gutters and drains and shingles and everything, and could not find where the water was coming from. But shortly afterwards, we had a problem with the sump pump. Sump pump was gushing out water, pooling, and re-entering the basement. We would get a plumber in there to find out that the pipe in there was totally clogged. It would have been too costly to dig it up and put a new pipe, so we, you just had them install the new bypass pipe to take care of the water, draw it away from, from the building. At the same time, they found out, they discovered that the, uh, the drains that the gutters were going in was also severely clogged. And that may have been the problem with the water backing up and maybe causing the problem with the ceiling. So we had a, a new pipe put in there, and so far, so good. So I'm so hoping that, that took care of the problem. Um, then, of course, we had a problem with that tree. Uh, that big tree in front of the property has a few dead limbs on it. One of them did come crashing down. Uh, luckily, it didn't cause much damage. It did happen to hit your little uh, mailbox planter a little bit, <laughs> but at least it didn't, didn't cause any severe damage or didn't, didn't, any injuries. But uh, there are some other limbs in there in danger of it. So we do have a plan set. We're just waiting to get the, uh, the tree people over here. They're pretty busy. Um, I thought they may have been here by now, but they should be here shortly to take care of that problem. Unfortunately, the tree will have to come down because it's just uh, too old, too damaged, and uh, don't want to take any chances of causing any, any further trouble with that. Uh, then moving on to the other properties. Oh, I want to thank, first of all, I want to thank Marcos for his help in, uh, in that garage across the way. I mean, that was looking kind of rather unsightly since the damage on it was all peeling paint and looking 
looking rather bad. So uh, looking for myself is getting over there and scraping all that paint, putting a new coat of paint on there. It doesn't alleviate the problem t completely, but at least it makes it a little more presentable for passers-by and for, for visitors. And then, of course, there's the ongoing problems with the fence. <laughs> We've had more problems with that fence and being blown over and being fallen over. I know I've spent some time on it. Pastor himself has spent quite, quite a bit of time reinforcing it. And I want to thank Manny out there for, for his, his time. He spent the whole afternoon out there reinforcing it as well. So, so far it's, it's been standing, but their plan is uh, we already have someone who's going to contribute the, the money for the materials. And thank you, Marcos, for finding the, uh, uh, the estimates for us for the materials. And the plan is we are going to put in a new fence with sturdier supports uh, so we won't have that, that problem anymore. Um, other than that, we have uh, other little projects will be coming up. Uh, of course, you didn't mention if we ever get funds together, we can finally put a, an awning over the, uh, over the handicap ramp. But I noticed that uh, some of the paint has been peeling around the front of the windows. Uh, it's just something unsightly. It's something that probably can be a, a fairly easy, quick, but just take a, a project for, for a few hands. And speaking of hands, I want to thank all those people who do step up and, and lend their hands. I mean, people come up to, to help clean up at various times, especially before the Easter hunt. They come up and clean up the area and look really nice. And uh, people take care of the flower bed up there and make it, make it more presentable. So it makes our job easier. I mean, this. We have the trustees, but the trustees aren't everyone. Uh, we're going to call on people as, as they can to come, to come and help us with these projects. I mean, after all, this is God's house. We want to make it as preventable, as presentable as possible. And we want to make it as inviting as we can. Make Bethany Church inviting to all those come and worship here. Amen. Do you stand with us again? This is the air I breathe.
lost without you I'm lost without you Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, through the words of this chorus, we have confessed our need. And we thank you for bringing us together to this place where we can be made aware of our great need for you. And this morning, we want to thank you for guiding us, for bringing us here. We thank you for your grace, your patience, your love. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for changing our lives and for giving us direction. And this morning, there is a deep desire in our hearts. We pray that you may increase the thirst and the hunger for righteousness in our lives. We thank you for the privilege of acknowledging you today as our Lord and Savior. Father, we bring the rest of this service to you. We pray that you may anoint your servant and your word. Open our mind our heart and our understanding that we humbly say may your will be done in my life today lord we bring those who are not able to be here to worship you with us the shut-ins the ones in the hospital the ones in the nursing homes, the ones that cannot come and enjoy what we have been enjoying this moment. We pray for this country and its leaders. We pray for the president, for the governors, for the mayors, we pray, O oh Lord, for those who have been elected to serve. We pray that you may bless them with your peace and grace, that their work may result in blessings and help for everyone in this country. Lord, we remember that in many places in this world there is no peace, Many people dying every day. Lord, it's our great desire that the wars would come to an end and the killing and the suffering and the destruction. Lord, we do not know how to pray, we confess, except to say, may your perfect will be done. Lord, we would like to see change, we'd like to see peace. So we pray that the God of peace may bring peace to this world. I pray, dear Lord, that you may give us understanding to acknowledge your sovereignty over our lives. We pray for your church as a whole. We pray for revival, O Lord. As you told your disciples not to depart from Jerusalem until they could be filled with your Holy Spirit and empowered with the Holy Spirit. Oh Lord, give us that great desire not to leave your presence until we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the day of Pentecost and what it meant to the world. We pray though that you may revive us again and we may see the power, the changes, real conversions, the transformation of lives. 
we may see a new day for each one of us, for your church, and for the Church of the Nazarene as a whole. We pray for our general leaders, district leaders. We pray for our church leaders, our pastors, our, the church boards. We pray, Lord, that we may witness during our lifetime a revival. We may see God's mighty work among us. Let it begin today. We lift up our pastor to you and the word he has for us. Oh, Lord, speak to each one of us today and help us to see the glory of God among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Well, neuroscience studies have revealed something you might not know, although you have experienced it probably many times, and that is the power of the number three. The number three. Our brains seem to love the number three because of our kind of our short-term uh, memory, uh, best remembers patterns of three. To your brain, the number three feels kind of like whole, complete. That's why memorable instructions are given in sets of three, like uh, stop, look, and listen at uh, train uh, crossings, right? Stop, look, and listen, easy to remember. Or what about stop, drop, and roll, right? When you're on fire easy thing that they teach children, right? It's also why so many sermons have three main points, unless your pastor's long-winded, right? Thank you for not saying amen. <laughs> Jesus was apparently aware of this power of three uh, because after 40 days of being with the disciples together after the, the resurrection and opening their minds to the understanding of scripture, Jesus gave them three final instructions before he ascended into heaven. Three final instructions. And it's found in Luke chapter 24 uh, this morning. Luke chapter 24 and verses 45 through 51 and, and as I read it, let's see if you can come up with the three instructions that Jesus gave. Luke chapter 24, verse 45. Then he opened up their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead, and on the third day... <clears throat> And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out of the victory, the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Anybody get the three? It's in there. Right? They, they are actually repeated in the book of Acts. I don't know if you know that the... the <laughs> excuse me, the book of Luke and the book of Acts are actually written by the same individual, right? And so uh, in uh, Luke was the author of both, and um, in Acts, he kind of repeats those three 
so that we would make sure we grabbed onto them. So Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, listen again, see if you can get the three, right? On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of the Father promised, which uh, you heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then he gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So anyone want to take a guess what the three things that Jesus wanted his disciples and us to really remember and go after? Want to take a guess? Stay. You got it. Stay. Good. Yeah, be filled and go. He must have read my notes when he came up to pray. <laughs> Stay, be filled, and go. And just a little bit of different wording, but wait in Jerusalem, which is stay, right? Receive power from the Holy Spirit, and then go. Be my witnesses. Are the three things that Jesus challenged those disciples with and challenges us with today as we think about the day of Pentecost. Wait, receive, and witness. So let's look at the first one. You and I are to wait in the presence of God in prayer as we seek to bless our community. You know we've been on the subject of blessing our community, right? And this, by the way, is the final sermon in this series. So, um, but it does, Pentecost does tie into that. Because we're to wait upon God, wait in the presence of God in prayer as we seek to bless our community. Why did the disciples have to wait? God had a plan. And God had timing for his plan. By the way, you are not here today by accident. Do you know God has a plan? He has a plan for your life, for my life, for this church. God is at work, right? And he has a plan. And so we need to wait upon him. God has a plan for us. Scripture says that we're to seek him while he may be found, right? It says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. That's all about what Jesus was challenging those disciples to do. Wait. Just, just stop and seek God. Have you ever waited in the presence of God? The disciples waited for 10 days before receiving from God. They waited for 10 days. Do you know what happened after five days? Absolutely nothing. Do you know what happened after seven days? Absolutely nothing. And if they had left because God wasn't working on their timelines, they would have missed out. God says, wait for me. Let me work. Before we act, we are to wait. We must wait for God to give us what we need, to invest in us. Our knowledge, our ability, our power is not enough to change lives, to change this world. It's not enough. And too often, we hurry and take action before we wait upon God, right? Let's just do this. And let's just do that. And 
Now, I'm definitely not abdicating just waiting and that's it, but that's a whole nother part of the sermon that's coming in a few moments. But it begins with us waiting upon God, right? We sang about that earlier, right? I'm desperate for you. I'm lost without you, God. Waiting upon God. Before we do our projects, before we do our own things, before our wisdom comes into play, right? Back in high school, in, uh, in upstate New York, we, we uh, took driver's ed in, in the summer. And uh, my first day of driver's ed, they, you know, I didn't think anything was going to happen, right? But uh, they, they teach a little bit, and then they sent us out into these brand new cars that, uh, that the local car dealer had uh, loaned to the driver's ed program, right? So we climb in the car, and we're off. <coughs> and after a while, it happened to be my turn to drive. So I'm in the driver's seat, and the driver's ed teacher sitting next to me, and we take off down the road. And there is this intersection, right? And this big semi-truck was there in front of me. And there was this little space to the right of the semi-truck. So I figured, that's enough space for me. And I floored it and turned right. Do you know the light turned green? Not only did I floor it to turn right, but the semi-truck was turning right. He was just making a very wide turn. And of course, you know, me being very young and thinking I knew it all, I just hit the gas more and took off, right? I did beat the truck. <laughs> and then the driver's ed teacher looked at me and said, you're dangerous. <laughs> Why was I dangerous? I didn't wait for the instructions. I just went off and did it on my own. Do you know, sometimes I think God looks at us and says, you're dangerous. <laughs> you're not waiting for the instructions, right? You're not waiting upon God for him to guide. John chapter 14 and verse 26 says this, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. It's Pentecost. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said, I'm going to send you someone who's going to teach you and show you and remind you, right? Right? But that means we have to wait upon God. We have to seek God in prayer, right? Do you know <coughs> one of the most important ministries we have in this church is the prayer ministry? Because we can do nothing without God. And we need to in increase that. I'm going to be talking in just a couple of weeks, uh, kind of giving you my state of the church thing. And one of the challenges is we need to increase the amount of people and the amount of times we spend in prayer because we need to seek God. It is by him, right? Waiting has to do with our relationship with God. God does not want us to go and do without him, right? In fact, in the Old Testament, Moses was leading the children of Israel, and uh, <clears throat> they had sinned, and of course, and uh, God wasn't happy with that, but Moses, interceding for them, said, okay, God, we ask you your forgiveness. We want you to forgive, and God said, okay, you can go, but I won't go with you, and Moses said, if you don't go, we don't go. It was that desperate for God's presence and waiting upon him. 
Remember, the first and greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all of your heart, right? Seek him. Spend time in his presence. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If you're today feeling a little lack of energy, maybe you need to spend more time with God because he's our source. He's the one that empowers us. He's the one who enables us. So secondly, the second command, again, from Jesus or the challenge, is you and I are to be empowered by the Holy Spirit as we seek to bless our community. We're to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I already said, God has a plan, right? And God will give us what we need to see that plan happen. God, and it's an old saying, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. God enables us. God's power, right? I mean, you see all the time um, articles and things that say, today, if we were choosing a group of 12 to lead the church, just like the disciples, we would not choose the disciples, right? But God did on purpose. Why? So that his power could be seen through them. Not so they could be seen, but so God could be seen. God's power through the Holy Spirit will give us everything we need. The church grows and li lives and, and lives are changed, excuse me, not because of our ingenuity, or our resources. And it's not even by accident. Whoops, the church grew, right? No. Things happen because of the power of God through the Holy Spirit. Just like what Pastor Delgado was praying this morning. God, we need an outpouring of your spirit if we're going to be effective in this world. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It's not by force, nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of the heaven's armies. <laughs> not, by, not by your strength, not by your ingenuity, not by what you can do, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this may sound like something old-fashioned, but you know, there's an old saying, if you don't get it, go back to the beginning, go back to the basics. Here's the basics. We cannot do it without the power of the Holy Spirit, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. This is Paul, one of the greatest Christians there ever was. Here's Paul, and he says, and my speech and my preaching were not with pervasive, persuasive, excuse me, yeah, words or human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Right? We were not meant to live the Christian life on our own on our own power. Instead, we're to walk in the spirit, the Bible says. Let's face it, and here's, here's a little surprise for some of you. I know this will be, you know, a, a shock to someone, right? You're not that impressive. <laughs> Do you know that? I know that's a shock. We're not that impressive. But you know what? God is. God is. Many people say all the time, well, we're just a small church. We can't do much. If we were one of those mega churches, then things would be different. 
Church, the size of the church has nothing to do with the impact. It has nothing to do with the impact. That's a worldly concept, right? We can produce, you know, the lights and the smoke and the rock bands or whatever they do, and it's going to do nothing to change lives. The impact is in the power of God to transform a life, right? It is. So therefore, if we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible, right? Because if it was all about size, the number of people we have, the the amount of money we have, that's what people would look at. Oh, they have a lot of money. Oh, they have a lot of people. What do we have? The power of God to transform lives. It's about God. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John were walking together and came across a lame beggar. And here's the response to the lame beggar. Most of us, if we came across a lame beggar, we'd begin to pull out our wallets to see what we have, right? But here's their response. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, and what did he do? Walking and jumping and praising God, right? People all the time say, well, we can't do what Jesus did. He was the son of God. Here's Peter. He's a man, just like you and me. He's an ordinary person with the power of God flowing through him. Right? That's what we have to offer our world. Well, number three, you and I are to be witnesses about God's grace as we seek to bless our community. And this is what I alluded to before. Yes, we must sit and seek God and his power. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, revived by the Holy Spirit. But then you know what? Where to go? Scripture says, faith without action is dead. Right? The world needs to see the power of God. Where do they see the power of God? Through us. Through us. We are to be witnesses. And here's how it was described in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each other. and to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, 
because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked. Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites. Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. <laughs> then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the Wouldn't it be cool if we were so filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit that people said, oh, they must be drunk. Wouldn't that be cool? The presence of God in our lives so much. And three thousand people were converted that moment. Three thousand were converted to be followers of Jesus. This is what we're to do. We are to receive power from the Holy Spirit and then we're to go out and be witnesses. And for some reason that word has gotten a, a kind of a negative tone for in church or a um, become a dirty word. Oh, don't talk about witnesses. But that's because we make it out to be more than it is. We are not to be, to convert people. That's God's job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. We are not to argue with people. We're to just talk about Jesus, right? That's what Peter did that day. He said, listen, let me explain this to you what's taking place, right? Witnesses don't argue. They don't come up with amazing plans. They don't try to convince. They just share what they know, right? Jesus. They just share what they know. We carry the presence of God to our world, right? And in, in a time, why in a time when we're talking about blessing our community do I talk about witnessing? Because that's a part of it. It goes hand in hand. As people see what you do, then you can explain, just like Peter, no, you don't understand. I'm doing this because God blessed my life and he can bless your life. That's witnessing. God has blessed and touched me and he can do the same for you. That's witnessing and we by the power of the Holy Spirit can make a difference and you say well I don't know when and where to do that go to step number one wait upon God if we are in tune with God God will provide the opportunities God will open the doors and I know some of you have heard reports of some of you um, going over to the, uh, the uh, food pantry and helping out over there. Wonderful, because we need to go. Get out of these four walls. Go and be my witnesses, God says. Last week, we learned that God is a blessing God and that we are the heirs to the blessing that was initially given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. 
That blessing was passed down through the people of Israel, through Jesus, to the church. Who's the church? We are, right? But a big part of the blessing, we are passing along is Jesus. Do you know that? He's the true blessing. We're passing it along to others. What if somebody doesn't want? That's all right. Right? I've had a ton of people tell me, well, you know, you ought to try this, right? Hey, when I go over my um, brother-in-law's house, he pulls out these um, little fishies in a can and says, you got to try this. No, thank you. <laughs> Now, he isn't offended by me saying no. I don't think so. Anyways, <laughs> right? And it doesn't ruin his day. He just says, okay. And he eats them and moves on. If you're sharing Jesus and somebody says, no, I don't want anything to do with that. Okay, no problem. And just move on. Right? It's not that hard to be witnesses be witnesses. We are sharing Jesus. And it doesn't have to be. God does not call us to make a certain number of converts. In fact, God doesn't call us to make converts at all. He calls us to make disciples. Discipleship is a long process. And that person you're talking to may be at the beginning they may be ready to receive Jesus, but just leave that up to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit guide us. In fact, this whole blessing our community thing, the worst thing we can do is hold on to the blessing of Jesus to ourselves, right? One of the big criticisms of the church these days is that, oh, they're just, they're just, in there for themselves. They're just focused in on themselves. The worst thing we can do is hold it to ourselves. Nowhere in scripture can you find that. Oh, just grab onto Jesus and hold it to yourself. Don't let it out, right? That's the worst thing we can do. Do you know what the next worst thing we can do is? Require people to come here to receive Jesus. Will some people do that? Sure. Will a lot of people do that? No. So requiring them you know, is it, just like I preached the other day, right, to you. Okay, Thursday, we're going to bless people. We'll open up the doors and tell you if you want to be encouraged and blessed, come. How many people are going to show? We need to go. We need to take Jesus out there to our world. The disciples did not stay in that upper room. They left. And they went out. They went out into their community, right? They went out to make a difference with the power of God. The three instructions from Jesus are wait. Wait upon God. Receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And witness, just witness. And yes, witness happens in many ways. It happens by us serving. It happens by us speaking, right? But just go out and be the presence of Jesus. Some of you today, you need to wait before God, right? God needs to become more of a priority in your life. You say, well, pastor, I don't see this power happening. I'm not very effective at witnessing. Would you sit at God's feet and allow him to work in your life? Some of you need that this morning. Some of you need the Holy Spirit's power in your life. And you may say, but pastor, I'm saved, yeah. But pastor, I'm sanctified, yeah. But you know what? 
All of those disciples were followers of Jesus, but they were very ineffective before Pentecost. They were stumbling all over the place before Pentecost. Then when the power of the Holy Spirit came, it changed everything. Some of us need to cry out to God, revive us, O oh Lord. Stir our hearts. Rekindle our souls. And then all of us need to get outside these walls, outside our comfort zone, and bless our community. Carry Jesus. I have those cards that you all wrote on and going to be looking at those and talking to the church board about those. We need to get out, folks. There's a challenge that I give the church board all the time, and, and I believe I shared it with you last year when I did my pastor's report, but it's simply this. If our church disappeared today, would anyone in the community notice or care? Not anybody here. Would anybody out there notice or care if we just disappeared today? If not, we're not going. We're not witnessing. We're not empowered by God to be his presence. Would anybody notice if just we closed the doors today and shut down? You see, we've got to impact our community. We have got to take the message of Jesus out there. We need to be engaged. And there's no time like the present to change that, right? To be the presence of God in our world. Well, let me pray for you. Father God, thank you. Thank you that you did not leave us alone. You sent your precious Holy Spirit to empower us and teach us and help us. And God, we pray we would be a people, a people that wait upon you, that we would be desperate for you. God, we pray we'd be a people empowered by the Holy Spirit. God, nothing's impossible with you. May we live that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God, may we go from this place and touch lives and be the presence of Jesus. I pray a blessing upon each one here this morning. Minister and encourage each, I pray. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful day.